Hi, I'm Hayley Solich and welcome to the Gold Digger Podcast where we're digging the dirt and finding the gold. Grab a cuppa, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. We're having a great time here in the studio but before we start digging for gold I just want to acknowledge that I'm broadcasting from Wajak Nungabuja here in sunny Perth and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land past and present and just a, a big hello to all those people out in community that I know. As you know, this podcast is about unearthing the wisdom from ordinary people's lives. I'm fascinated by how people get through life, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. But before we get down and dirty with our next guest, Rachel, I want to share with you a quote. Diversity is having a seat at the table. Inclusion is having a voice. And belonging is having that voice be heard. I'll read that again. Diversity is having a seat at the table. Inclusion is having a voice and belonging is having that voice be heard. Equity says we all must change to enable their participation. So imagine there's three people that come to the same fence. Person one is is tall, person two is of medium height and person three is short. If they need to see over that fence, equity says, give person three a box to stand on so that they're at the same height as person one and give person two another box that brings them also up to the same height. But what if one's blind? I suggest we need to go one step further. I say, consider the lived experience of the person and adjust not only to the physical environment, but also to the emotional and spiritual environment. Imagine that person one carries the fear and pain of being bullied for being tall and that sometimes they overreact because they miss what people are saying and they feel saddened by that feeling of standing out. And imagine if person two, well, look, they're pretty content because they generally fit in with everybody. You know, they're middle of the range. They don't stand out. And so they're pretty happy with themselves. But then person three carries the fear and pain of being bullied for being short and from a minority group. You know, getting them to the same height does not address the disadvantage of their lived experience or their emotional journey. And I say that opportunity alone is not enough. True equity is enabling the opportunity for the same respectful trauma-informed experience for all. That means addressing biases and being aware of people and it requires other awareness, awareness of how others may be thinking and feeling. As we're speaking about equity, I'm thinking of our next guest, who is a champion for this space. She's a wonderful woman. We've had so many wonderful conversations and I will waste no more time in introducing to you Rachel Oliver. Oh, thanks Hayley for having me. Welcome. I'm I'm just so excited to have you here because I know we're going to have a great chat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So, Rach, before we start, I I do this with all of my guests because it just helps our listeners sort of get an idea of your personality and character. Sure. Can you choose an animal that best describes you and just let us know why you chose that animal? Yeah, well, I struggled with this because I'm not a real animal person. So, But what I did do, I had a bit of a Google last night and I came to look at the eagle and I was talking to my daughter about it and because the eagles around soaring high and you know being almost on top of your game and almost in that leadership space and that's where I'm going to so my daughter thought that that was a good animal to choose um, so I'm going with that for now <laughs> fantastic well I, I love that I, I the eagle is you know as you know is my logo for my yeah yeah my sure. advocacy work and yep. uh, rising above you know the crows they peck at you but you rise above those situations so no I really love that well today I'm I'm a beaver today yeah. I have been a busy beaver this have, week yeah. I've been storing up and building up and damming up <laughs> I'm just hoping the dam doesn't break yeah. <laughs> just for now <laughs> just for now so okay let's get on with conversation that we're going to have together I'd just like to uh, invite you, Rachel, to introduce yourself to everybody. Tell us who you are, what sure. you do, anything you would like to, sh- to share with the world. Thanks, Hayley. Well, uh, I guess most importantly, my, my biggest responsibility is that to my teenage daughter. 
Um, but I'm also a lifelong learner, an academic, a business owner, advocate, consultant, research assistant. Wow. Uh, yeah, I know, lots of different hats, but they all exist within the lived experience peer mental health space and um, yeah just loving that the enjoyment of them all super passionate around all my work fantastic and and just for those out there that may not understand the word peer can you just sort of give yes. a, a description so we say peer mental health is as far as having a lived experience and we're uh, working or supporting alongside someone not necessarily helping or sometimes it could be an aspect of helping um but you know we've we've got uh shared lived experiences and and we use our journey and our wisdom from our whatever our lived experience is and that's unique for each individual uh, we use that to inform what is called our peer work. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I love peer work. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we get, we'll probably get into a little bit of that a bit later. So how did you come to choose this mission in your life? You know, how did you, how did you get here how, and how has this work changed or shaped you? So, sure, yeah. So, so great, great question. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's different for everyone, but for me, I think the work actually found me. Um, so following experiencing what is called typically postnatal depression, but what I now choose to use the term as mothering through distress, um, I wanted to use all my experiences, which are over a long period of time, I wanted to use that for good. Um, so I find it all cathartic being in that lived experience, peer space, my journey, the recovery that's still ongoing. And yeah, it's it's what I enjoy, I love, I'm passionate about. So yeah, I think it found me, which is great because I wouldn't want to do anything else. <laughs> yeah, and I think the I think the beauty of peer work is that it's it gives meaning yeah. to those things. And uh, just for those that are listening, Rachel and I have a, a shared experience of postnatal depression, mm. uh, and I know how difficult it was to come through that space. And I think there's a lot of a uh, lack of understanding in the community absolutely around what that impact is on on the mother yes uh it it can be really challenging very 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 challenging let's just put it that way and extended family and husbands yeah. and partners yeah as yeah. well yeah the impact on the those impact is, everyone yeah yeah and and so i think that being able to take that experience and and you know there's commonalities across mm. with what i went through with what other people are going through and to be able to to say now that has an additional meaning mm, that's yeah. beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's where the wisdom comes in is that maybe we had a really crappy time and whatever that looked like for me, for you, for other people. But I'd love to be able to think that I could support a new mum or new parents, whatever that looks like. And that might be same-sex couples. It might be single parent, who knows, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever, love is love. Um, but... I would just love to be able to think that we can reduce some of the bias and discrimination that's existed, like, say, 15 years ago when I was going mm. through it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, look, so many memories just flood me. Yeah, yeah, when know, when right. you say those words, yeah, you go, yeah. oh, my God, I remember yeah. that. You know, it, it was a very difficult time. Yeah. But, I, you know, I think that's uh, – I, I often think about that as being my – Scar turned into a star in my life. Yeah. It was great. the start of a transformation in me because I was so desperate to never be there again. Same. Absolutely. Uh, it really, it strengthened me in a way that nothing else could, I think. Um, yeah, I agree. And what I did was because I wasn't really happy with what's typically called the medical model, going to the mm -hmm. GP, going on antidepressants. I yes. was just sick. I was unwell on anything that they gave me and I was reluctant to just trying to persist with something that wasn't working so then I educated myself yes right yeah and then now because I've always valued education now I'm like oh okay that's key yes. having the education or having access to the education yeah is key in people's recovery that's just a small part of it yeah knowledge is power absolutely, absolutely powerful and yeah. yeah no I love that race they're really good points so so just sort of sitting in your you know the mission shows you uh, and you've been able to sort of bring your life experience into that workplace and that's uh, got its own little reward in that. Mm. But what what has been the, the, the most difficult aspect of the work that you're doing? Yeah, good question because I'm moving, just this week I'm moving into what's called peer supervision and I'm moving into the leadership space. So that's bringing 
some really exciting uh, opportunities, which it's been exciting since I've started, but more so with um, hopefully being at a higher level of, you know, providing peer supervision yeah. and leadership roles. So I think for me now, because um, people might assume it's the emotional content of what we do and fatigue yeah. and stuff that comes with that compassion fatigue. But for me, I have to now decide where to uh, direct my energy so yeah. best. Yes. So I've only got, we say, so yeah. many spoons or the bucket's yeah. half empty, half or whatever you want to look at it. But now I'm like, okay, I've got so much time to make an impact as I get older and mm. nurture and support young and up and coming peers. Yes. And I think that, you know, what they say about, you know, the whole thing around uh, give a man a fish, he'll be back. But if you teach him to fish, he mm. won't be, he won't need to come back. And I think it's the same with this, with the mentality of, of imp- uh, imparting knowledge, wisdom, understanding mm. into the next generation yeah. of peer workers. I think that's a fabulous mm. uh, approach and ment- you know, mental space to have to the work you're doing. Can you just describe what a supervisor does just for people who, who yeah. aren't, haven't had any experience of clinical language or, yeah. or peer language? In a peer space, what does supervision look like? Sure. So, like, people may be familiar with what's clinical supervision. That's quite different to peer supervision. So it could look like a bit of coaching, a bit of mentoring, a bit of support around professional development, um, the opportunity to vent, the opportunity to talk about your workplace, to talk about personal life, to talk about the intersectionality that comes with all that. So for any person depending on their role and their role might not always be defined in a job description we find in our peer space so then a peer supervisor might provide some clarity some emotional support some professional support it could look different for each individual and we're still tweaking our space right where it's exciting but we're still like I'm going to be new to peer supervision and I'm thinking what would I want as a new peer or someone established as a peer worker and peer worker can mean so many different things as well yeah that's right and like you 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 are like in my brain my brain's going tick 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 as you're talking about that and I'm remembering my experience of having a supervisor yeah uh which was so fabulous um because there were questions when I was doing the care of peer work there were questions around uh, how to best manage the conversation I was having you know or or how to respond to a really difficult scenario mm. um, that someone might be yeah. having, and 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 where does you know where does my responsibility end, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, so I, you know, I had the best, um, you know, yeah, best we've got supervision. Some, we've got some good supervisors out there, yeah. and we're growing that space. And I think my thought is around when I'm thinking about what type of peer supervisor I want to be. I'm like, there's aspects of, you know, people say you can't be friends. And I'm like, well, it's an emotional journey. Yeah. So it's intimate still. We're not um, excluding anything. Everything's on the table to a certain degree. And we're all in and out of each other's space, depending yeah. on where we work. Yeah, it's so, hard to not be friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we all know each other, like Perth Small. So I'm thinking, well, as time goes on and I get a bit more experience, I'll have a clearer idea of what sort of, what that looks supervisor like. looks like yeah. but the empathy and the acceptance and the understanding is vital from me yeah 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 and i think that you know look this is where peer and, and clinical are mm. so different because a clinician doesn't um the clinician holds all of themselves back and the power is there uh, whereas a peer is is going to share their life in yes. some ways. I'm not saying that peer work is walking as a friend because you're no, not a friend. You're no, actually a, a worker. Still professional. Yeah. Still professional. But I think within within peer worker to peer worker, it it's very difficult to do the aloof thing because yeah. we all see it and call it. Yeah. You, you know. The authenticity of yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's a really good point because we're invested. Mm. we are aligned mm. and we say we're not pushing from behind we're right alongside whatever that looks like in the peer space so yeah. so different to clinical supervision and that has its purpose but for PR um, I absolutely value the authenticity I say the no BS factor yeah I just thrive in that space of grassroots meeting people where they're at trying to do your best to if support's the right word in peer supervision but that's interchangeable i'm big on language um but yeah loving it yeah 
No, do, you're doing a great job. And I think that uh, the whole um, space, let's call it the yeah. space, the sector, mm. the sector. Uh, is poised for rapid growth. Wow, uh, yeah. And so it's so incredibly uh, timely. Yeah. That you should be sort of stepping into this space, and I know that you'll be brilliant. Mm, thanks. I have have no doubt whatsoever about that. Um, so, if you could change something, speaking about landscapes and the space, uh, if you could change something about this this landscape that you are uh, working in, what would that be? Yeah. So there's sort of an assumption that because we are in the landscape of the peer space that everyone values diversity equity whatever all the good stuff intersect awareness of intersectionality and we know that that's not true so there's still so much to be learned and my thought is first up kindness is so so vital right so kindness doesn't take much to smile and try to be (laughs) kind to someone you never know what's happening for a person on any given day right And that could change from morning to afternoon if you're in a a work environment. So my thought is whether they're a peer worker, young, a manager, a consumer out in the community. I support people down in Frio area. Um, You just never know what's happening on any given day. And then that can change really rapidly as well. So my thought is I always like to speak about empathy and acceptance, meeting people where they're at. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. And so... If I kind of cast my mind back to how we met, yeah, um, not right, right back because <laughs> we have known each other a very long time. But for, but in the mental health space, uh, probably where we reconnected was through recovery college. Yeah, yeah. And w- what did you get out of that experience? I'm just curious yeah. as to what what that what gift, they did what the me. gift was yeah. in that for you. Well, yeah. first up, reconnecting with you with you was yeah. amazing, but also um, I done. I'd already previously done a lot of PD and study mm-hmm. and, and ongoing work on myself. So my self-worth and, and what came with my lived experience journey. But the recovery college absolutely solidified and then gave me uh, confidence to then go, oh, I'm really okay where I'm at. Mm-hmm. I'm going to use these skills and build on them. And we say add to our toolkit mm-hmm. yeah. um, and then go out and be a lived experience educator fantastic yeah and for me um that's working at curtin university as a sessional academic i'm now a research assistant also at curtin i run my own consulting training and advocacy business so recovery college sort of just although i was getting there really solidified and you helped me with that just going yep you've got a moving on to getting a little bit older and hopefully a bit more mature and a bit more wisdom um yeah so really just feeling like i'm hitting my stride kind of helped you step into that space with confidence i love that yeah yeah and because i love doing the educators program at the recovery college that was just a a total joy Joy. to me that total joy to me being being with people who had like mind and and who had you know such great intention it's nourishing yeah very very nourishing and doing experiential learning rather than didactic training is such a different way um it just really works for me in my head space yeah likewise yeah Yeah, and very and and seeing just seeing other educators tackle the task creatively Mm. uh is inspiring in fact that got me to my job where i am at Mm. collective hope community services uh because i met you know, a couple of other trainers there. And yeah. so now I get to work with them. And so every day's play. I know, yeah, right. <laughs> we're blessed, right? Blessed to be in our space. Yeah, so blessed. So it really, it did connect uh, connect the network together really good. Um, I was curious because I was asking that because I was keen to hear a bit more about what you are doing at Curtin. Because mm-hmm. uh, you also did the leadership program at Curtin. Well, it, it's, I'll talk to that if yeah. that's okay. So it's called Valuing Lived Experience Program, FLEP it's referred to. Now, it's world class. So um, we were up there with probably, I think, another um, program in London and maybe one I think there's in Canada, but don't quote me. But we really, the FLEP run by and facilitated by the amazing Lim Marbu. Um, and we have a community of practice associated, mm. aligned with that. So that is our ongoing consistent learning. But what the Valuing Lived Experience Program does is value us, what we say is LEES, uh, yeah. Lived Experience Educators. We are now lecturing, consulting, adding to curriculum, having a direct impact in the classroom right up to master's level. 
Fantastic. In allied health. I know. So as a result of that, we've got all these allied health students and either going on PRAC or going out into the community once they're qualified. And they have a lived experience component, not just reading from texts. And so it's just, yeah, it's the best opportunities to jump in, be authentic, and say, in addition to the great curriculum that Curtin offers, this is something extra yeah, yeah. fantastic because i when i was at healthy minds i was um very keen to get carer training into that into yeah. the universities and had started the process mm-hmm. of you know making those connections but yeah. how wonderful that you know that that the consumer voice is really mm. in those spaces yeah and we're a combination of carers and consumers oh. we've got both right oh, fantastic yeah i didn't didn't realize yeah, that. yeah 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 so that's great yeah. yeah. So um so tell me more about um about how you are finding that. Yeah. Uh, like being in the classroom in yeah. those capacities and working. Yeah, yeah, well I love it. Um I thrive. I've always been a student, you know, from year 12 always studying right through now I'm turning 50 so it's sort of like never stop learning, always think uh consciously about always being the student whatever space you're in. You there's always opportunities to learn. But that, then having the power standing at the front of the classroom, I'm very aware of influencing, say, students have just come out of high school yeah. and are studying allied health. So that might be OT, speech pathology, um, even a little bit of nursing I do now outside of allied health. So we've got all these amazing lecturers that don't identify as lived experience that are championing us. Oh, wow. And there's about four to six of us that regularly work in the space. Fantastic. Yeah, and so we, sh- we you know, an example might be we share our lived experience for the purpose of, um, you know, like say occupational therapy, and then the students will go away and do an assessment and it might be a representation letter. Yeah. So what did they actually hear and what did they get, those yeah. little nuggets of wisdom. And then we might say something like, example, well, the language you use isn't strengths-based, person-centred, yeah. this might yeah. be offensive or non-empowering or whatever, you know. Yeah. That's an example. Yeah. Yeah. The look, look how the landscape is changing. Like, Absolutely. if I think back even six years, uh, you know, the to oh. have those conversations was even hard. Wow. It's amazing and, that she did. Yeah, it. and to have all the champions like um, Angus Buchanan up at Curtin, who absolutely is solid on keeping the VLEP program, we are indebted to people that aren't lived experience to champion our space as well and provide funding and be open to learning. And, and there's all that money there, the funding that's coming yeah. through, right, from the government. So yeah. even though it's been quiet in the media, we're getting millions of dollars to champion the lived experience voice. So I'm like, hallelujah, finally. <laughs> We've got progress in actually getting some money with that. Yeah. yeah. And, and look, I, I guess at the end of the day, it's it's not even about you, me, and how we are. It's about the experience of the individual Absolutely. when they receive a service, when they go into hospital, when they go into community uh, whatever community service, service it is, yeah, yeah. whether it be you know NGO or government um, funded, it's about what is their experience like mm, for them at that point of time. Yeah, and how is that helping or hindering? Yeah, hindering. Them? Yeah, yeah. One of the things I love about my work um, at Collective Hope is they do truly person-centered mm. approaches to their work in the psychosocial disability space and. I just love that the person comes first, mm. whatever that looks like. And sometimes it can be very painful for yes. us as an organisation. Yes, yeah, truly. Because difficult. we have yeah. to hold space for someone to make a choice and mm. give dignity of risk and yeah. be ready to catch them, you know, if they mm. fall down. Yeah. Um, but it is such a joy to see lives transformed. Absolutely. Because yeah. they do transform. Yes, recovery is possible. It is possible. You know, I've seen it firsthand. You know, one of our, our, we've got some amazing workers who who've come through the service Mm. and are now, Mm. you know, uh, in employment and having a wonderful life. Yeah. Uh, And it's not to say that recovery is the end point or the goal, but it's that they could be existing within some type of what looks like recovery to them. That's right. Yeah. 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 Because it's not, it's not not, linear. (laughs) It's not linear and it's, it's not what I think recovery is, you know. Yeah, same. You can hold hope for somebody to, to change to what you think it is, but it's actually what they think 
is, is, yeah. is the most important. Exactly. Because you might think, you know, I, I always wanted my kids to be dancers because I was mm. a dancer and I think, well, when they get a dancer, they'll succeed. That's it. They yeah. didn't like dance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they did, yeah. but we didn't have the money. You know, there's lots yeah. of factors that inhibit someone being able to do something. Yeah. Uh, so, so I can hold that hope till the cows come home. Mm. It might not be a reality and, yep. and it's unfair uh, to have expectations that the person doesn't hold for themselves don't align with them and, yeah. and that's where we see a lot of that whole goal setting or the ndis yeah. and those barriers that come through and i work in the community two days a week with peer support yeah face to face um so yeah that's where we've got to be so mindful of listening active listening yeah. engaging uh listening to their story one day then revisiting the next week and saying where are you at today yeah right? it might just be a shower today yeah. and then the next day it might be like a haircut <laughs> yeah look no so true so true and it's unfair to to judge yeah absolutely uh, yeah. the progress of the another individual and yeah no i, lo- I love that I was, I was looking at that quote earlier around identity being um dependent on the person's reality in yes. that moment how yes. they're perceiving reality and mm. uh, and who has the right to say my reality is more real than your reality because mm. we all see things differently and even if it's like what is a you know people say is a diagnosis which i don't like yeah. the word diagnosis because yeah. i don't align with the medical model but you know perception sense of reality can look so different to yeah. different people you know just in a, in a broader sense so we've got to be okay with you know talking to people that might hear voices yeah. or uh see things or just yeah. even like we were talking yesterday with um intentional peer support we were just talking about even people that experience ocd have a fear of contamination so that's a different sense of reality as well yeah that's right yeah that was my learning yesterday because i experienced obsessive compulsive disorder so i was thinking oh that's even a different perception and sense of reality to other people that i never even cotton on it was just like yeah. wow like by a moment uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah look no look we all got we all got we all got, stuff. got stuff happening. We all got stuff going on. We're all in progress. None of us are the final product, you know. No one gets a free ride. Yeah, we're, we're not perfected yet. We're all in train, uh, you know. And I think that th- this is the message, I think, to community is love. Yeah. Love unconditionally. Love somebody where they're at, no matter how broken or how well or how mm. uh, lo- how big big and brilliant they Mm. are in a moment or how very small and insequential they may look in the moment love yeah good point i absolutely uh, reflect back on one of our lived experience educators at kirshen and she will get up and say if you saw me you know 10 years ago you'd be giving up on me as a allied health professional right you would think i'd had no chance of working providing for myself being independent and here i am teaching you now and being paid equal pay to you know like professors and all these wonderful people have been through uni and are qualified as such i mean we we say qualified by experience but that always sits with me is that see us 10 15 years ago and then now like unless we disclose to you you wouldn't know yeah our journey yeah that's right absolutely right and I, it's funny because I'm, you know, 57 now. So I've been around, around, around the tree a few times, mm. <laughs> around the block a few times. Uh, and I was sitting with this thought just the other day. Someone came into my world and I, I shared a little bit of story with that person. And it was in that moment I went, they would have had no, no, no knowledge. They were kind of like, I never knew that. Yeah, uh, and even in writing our mutual friend Kath Mazella's yeah, book, yeah, I, yeah. I gave it to someone to read the first draft and. They've been a friend, like close friend for mm. a long time. And their first comment was, I didn't know. Yeah. I never knew that was that was her in a struggle or her in a battle. Absolutely, or, yeah. You know, and so so I think we um we need to take time. Time to sit with one another, to listen to the heartbeat mm. and, and that soul space of one another mm. and create connection and because when we do that so valuable for recovery. We we can love, we yep. can accept, we can feel like we have belonging, connection, all and hope. That stuff. Yeah, all, it's not in a, a tablet form. It's not yeah. in, 
you know, all the stuff that's clinically, you know, <laughs> based, uh, which it has its place for some people, but all that connection and deep understanding, the empathy, yeah. that that's what's needed. Yeah. Absolutely agree with you, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's transformative, I believe. Yeah, um, it is. And so uh, what 30-second message would you want to share with the world if you had, you know... I'll give you a tele- television network and you can put out there whatever it is you'd like to put out there. What would you like to share? Oh, God. Well, I'm big with, you know, supporting the LGBTI community and, and very much wanting to move into specialising in transgender health. So I was, you know, fall back on love is love. <laughs> but I think just to reiterate around the value of belonging, acceptance, kindness, all the soft stuff that, in today's world we've really disconnect or we seem to be connected online but not in person so just you know it doesn't take much to whether it's a neighbor someone at work pause ask how their day is and ask Mm. a second or third time perhaps because what a person will tell you first up may not be the true reality of what's happening for them right yeah that's right it's being comfortable to be it's, Uncom- it's being comfortable with the uncomfortable with circumstances <laughs> yeah i look there's a brilliant trainer i know christine richardson uh who you'll know remember yeah. from the course and i've done a few um gigs with her mm-hmm. she just has this ability to ask the difficult question mm-hmm. and then just sit with it pause sit yeah. there and wait 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 the person out silence and, is purposeful right yeah and silence is very purposeful just to sit and wait it out yeah I, I have a child who who has a bit of anxiety and uh often our conversations uh have long pauses because they mm. they internalize their anxiety so yeah. sometimes they can't speak mm. because of anxiety um, and then other times it just slows down mm. the communication and i've had to learn to go Here's the question. Wait. Mm. Yeah. Dum, 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 yeah. Dum, dum, dum. That's our learning as parents, yeah. as support people. And yeah. it can be really tricky. I mean, I've come full circle, whoever I'm supporting. Yeah. I've gone from thinking this is the way I want to do it. And then with all my learning from all my different hats and, and ongoing and wonderful people like you and everyone mm. I'm exposed to and I draw wisdom from and I'm continually improving what I say in my practices or my yeah. approaches – um, yeah, just to slow down and pause and listen. Active listening is so underrated. Oh, it's so validating to the person. For yeah. me, what yeah. that whole, uh, in my recovery journey, I mean, that's ongoing too, but um, I would say sometimes I'm a bit wobbly, but mostly I'm good depending on how the weather's, <laughs> you know, how the wind's blowing. But, um, yeah, very much so. We are all, all a bit wobbly. <laughs> Uh, then we can reclaim nutcase. <laughs> I always think we're all we're all like a uh, you know on a bike that's got a loose nut or two, <laughs> and, and you're riding along, going just hoping it's going to hold till you get to home. Yeah, and sometimes more than others, just treading water, right? And and so yeah. if we're experiencing that, and we have the privilege of you know things like food in the fridge and income yeah. and yeah. Um, shelter. And imagine for people that don't have the same privileges, yeah, yeah. how they're coping, right? Yeah, and, and, and also for those that do have some mental health stuff going on, you know, mm. I, I've known cases of people who don't trust food, Absolutely. don't trust food preparation and how he- how hellish their life must be. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, we have to hold space, I think, for people to have their life experiences and to, you know, to work their way through that. You know, I think I just didn't remember a friend who was very, very low mm. uh, and I, I went to see them in, in, in a hospital, went to mm. see them and I just said, would you like me to take you for a drive? Yeah, right. And they said, yes. So I popped them in the car and I just drove them all around the nice houses, just yeah, looking yeah, at nice look. houses and I occasionally threw out a line or two. Uh, what was in that for me? Nothing because they emotionally they were incapable of giving mm. me anything in that moment. Mm. But what did that mean for them? Yeah, Heaps, Probably no doubt. a lot. Yeah, yeah. A lot. That would have been someone coming in who's saying, I love you enough yep. to take time out of my day mm. to take you for this drive. I'm not being paid to do it. Yep. I'm genuinely I'm there you. as a caring 
friend mm. uh, and 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 not look I, I think they're the magic moments absolutely agree in with life you. and also just to highlight that you know we talk about family and friends and yeah. for some people we just rely on our friends and that's our family of choice yeah so I know when I was quite unwell with um, you know mothering through distress it was absolutely people doing similar things to that that were even coming into the house and saying do you want to just go to the shop for an hour without taking bub out yeah and yeah. I felt like a refreshed person to absolutely come back and then I could tackle the rest of the day, right? Yeah, so yeah. things like that. I remember my friend from my one of my best friends from Collie coming up and just saying, I'll come up and let you go out. Like she made that effort to come all the way up, support me and I went out for the day and then I thought I could tackle the rest of the week. Yeah, you what know, a difference. small steps, right? Just from wonderful people giving time and energy. Yeah. yeah. So I'm go- I'm gonna leave our listeners with the thought uh community has the word co at the start yeah it's so that's co that means you and me together yeah so co community Mm, love it so i think i want to leave leave you with the thought of how can you be part of the community Mm. how can you be part of being that co uh, this week this month this year Mm. this day uh, looking in your world and and noticing uh, people who may be missing mm. uh, because they're not traveling so well mm. people who who may need some support I always think of young mums as soon as I see young mums I go have you got support systems yes, in place same jump straight in first thing I ask them is yeah. who's looking after you yeah uh, and it. so maybe some young mums in your world think about who's surround your life and remember what Rachel said love what were the other words you used? Uh, acceptance. Acceptance. Empathy. Empathy. And just a little bit of kindness. And a bit of kindness. Great way to end our, our interview today. Thanks, Thanks so Hayley. much, Rachel, for and coming. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Been a pleasure. Absolute delight. Uh, we'll see you on the next Gold 